In the mid-1990s, Art Lambie collapsed while loading grain onto a truck. I noticed a tightening suddenly, a tightening across my chest, and uh, that was really all I remember for a while, other than coming to slumped against the wall of the grain bin and uh, a noise that I couldn't explain what it was. It turned out when I came to my senses that it was the auger running and beating on the, around the wood floor. The diagnosis was not, as you might think, a heart attack, but lung failure. Years of grinding feed and other exposures to grain dust and moldy grain without protection and years of ignoring the signals his body was sending him had taken their toll. His lungs were operating at 30% of their capacity. The doctor's advice? Get out of farming. The farm is a workplace, and I think that's what's most important to recognize. And unlike most industries, there's not a lot of people out there providing the education and the constant training that you would get in an industrial workplace. I think it's important that uh, the farmers recognize the types of exposures that are out there. Exposure to grain dust is so common that many farmers and other grain handlers don't give it a second thought. But respiratory reactions to grain dust can cause anything from a runny nose to chronic bronchitis and even the loss of lung function. Dusts in general can be dangerous to the lungs and it's largely due to the fact that the size of the dust and the, the particulate uh, component of it that people are exposed to can often be small enough to be inhaled into the respiratory tract and sometimes deeply into the respiratory tract. And that's true for pretty much any dust. Dust generation is going to be based on the type of grain, the type of storage, or the amount of dust is going to be dependent on your activity that you're doing. So whether you're swathing or combining, loading or unloading, different amounts of dust will be generated. It's going to be based on the uh, humidity in the air, the, the amount of moisture within that substance. Different dusts have different impacts on the respiratory system. So a barley dust, as most farmers know, or a canary dust is much uh, harsher on your respiratory system than a grain dust. And that's because of the type of dust it, that it is. It has little bars on it or little uh, tentacles that kind of uh, scratch on the way down. And uh, anybody who's worked with them knows that those are the itchier dusts versus the, let's say, softer dusts of the, of the wheat and canola. And I think, you know, that's important to recognize. And it will impact your respiratory system differently. Um, the size of the dust, so the smaller dust typically penetrate lower into the lungs than the larger dusts. The larger dust will settle out in your hair and your nose, and uh, your upper respiratory system. You'll cough and sneeze, sneeze those out. The smaller dusts go deeper. What's on those particle sizes also makes a difference. So you've got some chemicals attached to smaller dust sizes and the chemicals are entering along with the dust. So you've got the, uh, the insects or the fungi or the spores also attached to those dust. If you don't use either a respirator or some other means of protecting yourself, dust is breathed into your lungs. And if it's taken in over a period of 30 or 40 years, no wonder those who work in dusty environments have lung problems. If you're exposed to dust and you, you don't have any sort of protection at all, if you're not wearing a respirator, not wearing a mask, then what's likely to happen is uh, while you're breathing, and, and often, obviously, when we're working, we're breathing a little harder, our respiratory rate's higher, our circulation's circulating blood faster, uh, we tend to breathe more deeply, we breathe more frequently, uh, the smaller particulates in that dust that remain suspended can actually make it all the way deep into the respiratory tract. That can lead to various sorts of problems. These problems can range from short-term allergies, irritations, headaches, vomiting and poor appetite, to more severe conditions such as asthma or even chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, known as COPD. When we want to test for lung capacity or when we want to test lung function, we perform something called a pulmonary function test. Essentially, it involves um, blowing into a machine at uh, as, as hard and as fast as possible, and often for a number of tries and a number of breaths, just to determine how much lung uh, volume 
you have and how quickly you can get rid of that lung volume and how quickly you can sometimes fill it up again. Deep breath and push, 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 push. The procedure it can be uh, fairly tiring sometimes because you have to take a maximum breath in and blow it out very hard, very quickly, and sometimes you have to do that over and over again. And we can use portable equipment to do that and can actually um, travel to different locations and do it on site. The, the testing that's done in a lab in a hospital ses setting gives us a little more information than the portable testing, but the portable testing is quite good, is very good at detecting early signs of lung disease and capacity changes. Inhaling moldy dust can cause symptoms such as coughing, fever, chills, labored breathing, and muscle pain. These symptoms come on about four to eight hours after exposure, and they usually last a couple of days. This may be organic dust toxic syndrome that is a short-term illness, not known to cause any long-term damage. Or it could be farmer's lung. Farmer's lung is uh, an allergic reaction that occurs on exposure to dust or grain, usually, and hay especially, that's been contaminated with mold is the most common cause. It can happen from exposure to one or two instances of very, very high levels of dust. So if someone is moving hay or you know, throwing bales or, or somehow disturbing hay that hasn't been disturbed in a long time and maybe was in a fairly humid environment, quite warm, molds had a chance to grow, you disturb that, it releases spores into the air, those can be breathed in and that can cause this sort of allergic reaction that leads to farmer's lung. That can happen very quickly in some circumstances or if you've been, uh, it can also happen gradually, so if you've been doing that for a number of weeks or months or even over years of exposure to that mold, uh, you can develop this sort of long-standing allergic reaction and it leads to uh, difficulty breathing and uh, uh, issues with uh, lung capacity down the road and uh, can become quite severe if it's not recognized uh, early. And really the, the most important thing once it's recognized is to avoid exposure to that mold which is causing the allergic reaction. There are some situations when the agricultural worker is unable to avoid exposure to dust. Good design techniques can help to reduce the exposure extending spouts into covered feeders, dust collectors, and good ventilation systems will help keep the workers safe. You think about what is it that creates the most dust in an intensive livestock operation. It's the feed, how you feed, how far that feed is having to fall, how dusty that feed is in the beginning, and it's the animals. And um, so it's adding uh, oil to the feed is actually very, very effective in reducing the amount of uh, dust particles that are in the air, dropping the feed from a much lower area than a higher area. And automatic feeders versus manual feeders. Confinement buildings should allow for easy, effective cleaning. Substitute mechanical handling for manual handling. Ventilate areas where bales are being opened and sprinkle water to the cut side of a bale before opening or chopping. When you're in a small enclosed space, getting as much ventilation going as you can. So if there's windows you can open, those should be open versus working in a very closed environment. Use a wet rather than a dry process when cleaning inside buildings. Moisten the top layer of silage before removing it. Fast dumping of feed creates larger amounts of dust than does slower dumping. The workers who are working with the animals that are on the floor show less symptoms than the workers that were working with the animals that are in the cage system, which seemed a little counterintuitive at first until you go into those atmospheres and you think about it. The poultry are down at a very low level and the workers up at a higher level. So even if the chickens are running around a lot, the dust is percolating up slowly from the ground. Whereas if you go into a tiered system, the tiers are from the ground to you know, the seven or eight foot level, and so the dust is evenly distributed in your breathing area. And I think that probably makes a bit of a difference when the birds are running on the floor, is that it's a little damper there, the manure and the dust are not as fine as the environment you typically find in those cage-based operations. And whether the manure is moving out on the belts or being augered out, uh, it, just, it seems to be a much drier environment, and so things seem to be maybe sitting in the air a little bit. Feeding should be done just before leaving a room to limit worker exposure. 
organize equipment and work practices so that prevailing winds can carry the dust away from the worker. Don't work downwind if you can, work upwind, uh, which is always what I'm thinking about when I'm sweeping out my barn. I open both doors and then figure out which way the wind is blowing because you really don't want it blowing in your face. Working in an enclosed cab rather than in an open tractor also reduces dust exposure. Wear an approved respirator and don't smoke. You'll only add to your troubles. Your tractor may have a filter on it, but if that filter is, you know, 20 years old, what, you know, it's sort of like me putting on my uh, face mask that I've used 15 times over. It's not going to be as effective as a new one. Although rare, hantavirus is a concern for those who work in areas where rodents could be present. Hantavirus is a virus that is carried around in a variety of different mammals. It's most commonly associated with deer mice. It's a respiratory virus uh, that can be inhaled or we can also be exposed to it on our skin and through cuts and things. And it causes a very severe infection of the lungs and a disease of the lungs called hantavirus pulmonary syndrome. It's, uh, it's a very severe infection and, and up to 40 or 50 percent of cases can be fatal. So it's uh, often uh, found in the droplets of urine or in the feces of deer mice and of course there's sort of any sort of mouse related excrement. Uh, it takes sometimes up to five weeks for symptoms to develop. Uh, usually it's more in the order of sort of one to two weeks. Hantavirus symptoms start with a fever for about three or four days and then coughing and muscle pain, headache, backache, nausea and vomiting. The problem with this flu-like illness is most people don't go and seek treatment right away. Unlike the flu, there aren't any sore throat and nasal symptoms. If you are experiencing any symptoms, it's important to see a doctor. There isn't really a, a cure for it per se. It's, uh, it's important just to recognize that the infection's occurring quickly and to get uh, support as quickly as possible in a hospital setting. Prevention is possible. Eliminate nesting areas. Remove abandoned vehicles and old tires from your property. Elevate wood piles. Seal holes around the bases of buildings and clear away grass and brush. Use gravel underneath to prevent burrowing. You should, of course, avoid contact with potentially infected rodents and their excretions. Eliminate the mice with traps. Wear a HEPA or P100 mask and rubber gloves when you're cleaning up areas where there are droppings and wear goggles, boots, and overalls if there's a large amount to clean up. Sprinkle a bleach and water solution, wait 15 minutes, then shovel the droppings and remains into a plastic bag. Double bag, tie it up, and bury or burn the bag. Disinfect the traps and rubber gloves, and be sure to wash your hands. Whether it's rodents or whether it was past chemical storage, or you want to be careful whenever you're generating a dust. You want to protect yourself to the best of your abilities because you don't know what's in that dust. The last place to cut costs is your health. Equipment to reduce exposure to dusts and chemical residues should be the first thing on the budget for the year. Buy it and use it.